depleted uranium, the Gulf War. As she mentioned, during the Gulf War, we had a real problem. I'm a longtime military officer. I've been in the military since 1967. Served in Vietnam, was recalled to active duty for Desert Storm. Part of my job responsibilities during Desert Storm, I was a member of the 12th Preventive Medicine. We were the theater public health department. I also became a member of Bowers Raiders. We were the theater nuclear biological chemical warfare special operations team. We had the responsibility to identify it, to train and educate all of the military personnel, to develop the decontamination and medical care guidelines, and then to clean up the mess. The Gulf War was the most toxic war known to man. The United States, back in the 80s, deliberately and willfully provided Iraq with a weapons of mass destruction that we are about ready to go to war over today. That is all verified in the United States Senate report, provided the, called the Regal Report. You can uh, obtain that on the traprockpeace.org website. The other thing that happened is once we knew where it was and we went to war, we had to make a conscious decision. We made a conscious decision at the command headquarters that we would blow up Iraq's weapons of mass destruction in place, as chemical, as biological, as nuclear. That's verified in uh, Schwarzkopf's autobiography on page 390. We made that decision in December of 1990. The purpose was to destroy it where it was rather than for him to release it substantially back on the coalition forces as we went to war. Ladies and gentlemen, when we go to war, the purpose is to kill. The purpose is to kill the enemy, every single one of them. That is part of war. As a consequence, in preparation for war, or to ensure that we win the battles, the United States made a deliberate decision that they would use depleted uranium munitions, as they're called. In 1990, when I was deployed to the Gulf War, I didn't know a thing about depleted uranium munitions. Well, that's 20 some odd years after I initially went into the military. In December of 1990, I received a letter via the United States mail into a combat zone from the Pentagon from the senior health physicist for the U.S. Army saying, you better think about depleted uranium. And I go, what's that? I've never heard of it. Did not know. We went to war. We're blowing up all the chemical and biological stockpiles that Iraq has. This is like hitting an ice cube with a hammer. All that happened is it came back on all of us. It came back on the Iraqis, the Kuwaitis, and the Saudis. We use misused pesticides beyond belief. Toxic industrial chemicals. You're moving a city, a giant city, a giant military force, and they have to use all of that stuff. So all that stuff was released and came back on everybody. We had immunizations, the anthrax vaccine, that contains squalene instead of alum as the adjuvant. And the adjuvant is what gets the site ready for the reaction to make it safe again so that the antidote in the immunization will work. But squalene affected the immune system. We had food and waterborne illnesses all over the place. They lit off the oil well fires, and we had incomplete combustion byproducts, massive byproducts, inorganic, organic, heavy metals, and everything coming out of the oil wells, and we breathed that in. It was a toxic war, a toxic mess. And then depleted uranium came along. During the Gulf War, the United States fired over 350 tons of munitions containing uranium-238. 350 tons. Now, any place that we go, whether in Illinois where I come from, or here in Seattle, or in England, or any place around the world, if you were to take one pound of solid uranium-238 and throw it out in anybody's backyard or in your community park, or I just came from Massachusetts, if they were to throw it in the commons in Concord, Massachusetts, where our nation was born, you would go to jail forever. 
you would be in jail for a long time. However, the United States could take our radioactive waste, put it into munitions, and throw it into anybody else's backyard with immunity. Or so they continue to think. Depleted uranium munitions are solid uranium-238. They are not coated, they are not tipped. Each and every tank round fired by the Abrams tank is 10 pounds of solid uranium-238 contaminated with plutonium, neptunium, and americium. Now, the contamination came from the U.S. Department of Energy manufacturing sites in Paducah, Kentucky, Oak Ridge, and Tennessee, and Portsmouth, and Ohio. Solid uranium-238. Now, the A-10 Warthog aircraft, it's a phenomenal tank buster. It's excellent in combat, just like the Abrams tank is. Each individual round fired by the Warthog is three-quarters of a pound of solid uranium-238. They are not coated. They are not tipped. We fired about a million rounds of the A-30 millimeter during the Gulf War. 15,000 rounds of the tank round during the Gulf War for about 350 tons of solid uranium-238. The majority of the casualties during the Gulf War, the majority of those that died, the majority of the Americans that died during the Gulf War and that were injured in the Gulf War were as a result of friendly fire. The U.S. shooting the U.S. with uranium munitions. When I got the tasking from the Pentagon down through Norman G. Schwarzkopf, directly to D.G. Zulis. Now, Schwarzkopf was the theater commander, overall the top general. He was in charge of the war. D.G. Zulis was the theater medical commander, and I worked for him. They told me, clean up the D.U. mess, and I'm going to finish the job. When we got up into northern Saudi Arabia, KKMC, that's King Khalid Military City, we're collecting the U.S. friendly fire vehicles there. We walked in there, and members of the 144th Maintenance Company were in there working on this already, and they're in cutoffs in their boots, and that's about it. They're sucking uranium dust in. They're sucking uranium contamination. They're absorbing uranium contamination. We walked in there, and there's only one way to describe it, and it's very appropriate in this building, this church. Oh, my God. Within 72 hours, we were sick. Within 72 hours, respiratory problems started on myself and the rest of my team, and we were already seeing it on the individuals. The 144th was there, and we're already hearing reports of that from the friendly fire casualties. Within 72 hours. The rashes started, open sores that opened and bled. We're in a war. Things are blowing up around us. We're t pulling unexploded ordnance out of these destroyed vehicles. We're messing around. Now everybody says you've got to wear respiratory and skin protection or some type of respiratory and skin protection. It's a hundred and some odd degrees. And they told us all you need is exam gloves for your medical personnel and a surgical mask. Well, as everybody that's worked in the medical field knows that a surgical mask is good for spit and not much else. Now, uranium oxides are submicron in size, which means that we're seeing some of the size of marbles and sizes going down to submicron. And now, a submicron, one micron, is 10 to the minus 10th meters. This is atomic scale. And we're sucking this in. And the troops are sucking this in, and they're getting sick. Now, as the health physicist and responsible for the theater, I went to the medical commanders and said, you've got to provide medical care for all of the DU friendly fire casualties immediately. We need a radio bioassay, which consists of nasal and pharyngeal swab. You reach into the back of the throat with a Q-tip, and you find out they sucked in any uranium in. You collect their urine to find out if it's, it was collected in, and they're passing it out. You collect their feces to find out if they're passing it out. But you need to do it right away because in order to get heavy metal to poison, now uranium immediately starts out, your primary problem is heavy metal, not the radiological components. It's the heavy metal components. So we need to do chelation just like you do for lead poisoning. But it has to be done rapidly because of a thing called bio-half-life. 
And a bio-half-life is where the uranium then goes into sequestering in the parts of the bodies, or it passes out through the urine, and you'll never find it. They refuse to provide medical care to myself, my teams, the friendly fire casualties, and to this day, the number of U.S. friendly fire casualties, heroes of our nation, shot up by soldiers of our nation, still have not received the medical care that they earned in combat. We've still not all received the medical care we earned in combat. Myself and our team got sick within 72 hours, much less the friendly fire casualties. I'd go to the commanders of units that had the friendly fire casualties and said, provide them medical care, they have uranium poisoning. They never got it. Mr. Jerry Wheat, friendly fire casualty, a very good friend. His father discovered it years later. His father was a scientist at Los Alamos when had a Geiger counter and find out that, oh, my son's hot for radioactivity. Geez, it's the shrapnel that they never removed. That they never removed. We've had a toxic wasteland, an unbelievable toxic wasteland caused by deliberate Iraqi actions with their weapons of mass destruction in their scuds. I've had 32 scuds come in over my head and blow up. You just, you know, crawl under your bed, which is basically a canvas cot, and you put on your protective clothing and hope that that protective clothing works and that the warhead doesn't come down and blow up in your face. A toxic wasteland. What is depleted uranium? Depleted uranium is uranium-238. It is the byproduct, chemically known as uranium hexafluoride, when we remove the fissionable components at uranium-234 and 235 to make reactor fuel and atomic bombs. For every 100 pounds of solid natural uranium that I have, 99.2 pounds to begin with is uranium-238 and 0.8 pounds is uranium-234, 235, the fissionable component. When you go through the processing system, what you end up with is for every 100 pounds of solid uranium that you now have, you have 99.8 pounds of uranium-238 and 0.2 pounds of uranium-234 and 235. That is known as depleted uranium. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing depleted about it. Nothing depleted about it at all. Now, they keep saying, when you see a government report, they say it's 40% less radioactive than the other stuff. What they forgot to do was write down the other part of the paragraph that I put down for them. The alpha emissions, uranium gives off three primary emissions, alpha particles, which are the helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons. These are massive particles. When they get in the tissue, cause tremendous ionization damage to tissue. Absolutely rip it apart. And then you have the gamma particles, but those are outside, and there's not a whole lot. They're very small, pure energy. And then the beta particles, like an electron. That's what runs around in our electrical wires and provides us electricity. But when you change the proportion of uranium-238 from 99.2% or 99.2 pounds per 100 up to 99.8 pounds per 100, guess what? The alpha emissions increase proportionally. So when you get the uranium-238 in your body, no wonder we all got sick. A toxic wasteland, a deliberate use. I think that should clear it up. The other thing, too, with uranium munitions, ladies and gentlemen, they are not coated, they are not tipped, as I mentioned before. They are not coated, they are not tipped. You continuously see report after report where they say, well, the munitions coated and tipped like there's some steel or lead in there, and the uranium's on the outside. It's not. It's solid uranium-238, 10 pounds per round for the tank, and uh, three-quarters of a pound per round for the uh, A-10. Yes, sir? There is no coating. Absolutely. There's, there's a very thin copper coating on, on the A-10 round, the 30 millimeter round. It's so thin that it's only protect the gun barrel rifling. Then it's gone. And we don't have anything on the tank round. 
Okay? The only thing that's on Tancron is pain. Okay? So there's nothing there. It's irrelevant. Okay? So that's, I mean, how it works. Now, when a DU round impacts, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a warrior. When you, and you probably, if you've listened to Scott Ritter or met Scott Ritter, Scott's the chem portion, I'm the nuke portion, okay? God bless Scott Ritter. I can't say that enough. He's a good friend, and God bless him. He's another American hero. Okay. When the DU round is fired, you fire the DU round. Now, that DU round, you'll see it in the slides when I show those. The DU round automatically catches fire. Uranium is pyrophoric. It catches fire just moving it through air. Again, friction. Now, this round is moving extremely high velocity. The tank round is about three-quarters of an inch in diameter, and it's 18 inches long, and it's 10 pounds and weighs 10 pounds, or over 4,500 grams, when we actually talk about mass versus weight. Now, this thing is a gigantic kinetic energy dart. It's a massive dart flying at phenomenal velocities with tremendous forces and pressures over a little area, about three-quarters of an inch in diameter, and it just goes right in like mad. It kills everything. Inside the vehicle, you have spalling. The uranium is coming off, so what you see inside would be if I took a whole handful of BBs, ignite all these BBs, and, or ball bearings, throw them at extremely high velocity, and they're going through this vehicle at unbelievable forces, and anything that's inside ignites, anything that's in there blows up, anything that's in there dies. Now, you can have survivors in some vehicles. It just depends on where they were and how many rounds hit it, you know, and where the shrapnel went. It's a firestorm. It's a firestorm within the vehicle, beyond belief. Now, some of you have seen this and seen the videos where I show exactly what it looks like inside the vehicle on impact. And ladies and gentlemen, it's pure hell. Now, as that does, you have the uranium oxide and dust that are all formed. And what we learned from research firsthand in the desert and then when I became the director of the depleted uranium project for the Department of the Army, the Department of Defense, and NATO, I'm the guy that did the research. They told me to figure out how to use this in a war. And as a smart Army officer, I said, yes, sir, I'm going to go along and I'm going to try to figure out how to use it because when you go to war, the purpose is to kill. Ladies and gentlemen, the purpose is to kill. You need to understand that. So as we did this, we'd get out there and find out that the uranium dust and oxide surrounds the area right around inside the tank and around the tank, solid for 25 meters, about 80 feet. You must have full respiratory and skin protection to go near there, which means that you need to wear what we know as a gas mask and some type of clothing to protect your skin from getting it on. No question. The U.S. Army's own training manual, Common Task Training, specifies that they must do that. We know from research that once the uranium dust impacts, it will settle out in about 30 to 45 minutes, but the minute you come in or step in again, it's resuspended. It'd be like taking a whole pile of talcum powder and throwing it on your table, on your desk, and hitting your hand. It goes up, it stays airborne, it comes down, and you can breathe it in and suck it in continuously until it is physically removed and properly disposed of. We worked on this for three months. It took our team, approximately 100 individuals, primary individuals, three months to clean up 24 depleted uranium U.S. friendly fire vehicles that were destroyed in combat. Now we buried a whole bunch over in the desert with the human remains that I couldn't pull out. Had to un download unexploded ordnance and all the other hazardous materials on these things. And our team got sick right away. And ladies and gentlemen, the first cancer started within eight months and the first cancer death within two years. And the last one died last January. And it continues. I had a father and son. The individual that distributed all the depleted uranium munitions during the war, a very good friend of mine, very good friend of mine, his father was also with us and helped clean up the mess. The father's already done from, dead from lymphoma. Too many of my friends are dead from lymphoma. Too many of my friends are dead from all of these health effects. Depleted uranium munitions on impact are an awesome weapon. And therefore, as a consequence, the United States deliberately and willfully told us as early as 1991, when we were specifically tasked to clean up the mess, 
that no matter what, they were going to use the depleted uranium munitions. They were going to use the depleted uranium munitions. The famous Los Alamos Memorandum was sent to me in March of 1991 after I was tasked to clean up the depleted uranium munitions in the war. And I want to read this memorandum very specifically and quote from it so that you understand what is happening. Los Alamos, New Mexico, 1 March 1991. Subject, the effectiveness of depleted uranium penetrators. There is a relatively small amount of lethality data for uranium penetrators, either the tank-fired long version or the Gowie eight-round fired from the A-10 close air support aircraft. The recent war has likely multiplied the number of DU rounds fired at targets by orders of magnitude. It is believed that DU penetrators were very effective against Iraqi armor. However, assessments of such will have to be made. There has been and continues to be a concern regarding the impact of DU on the environment. Therefore, if no one makes a case for the effectiveness of DU on the battlefield, DU rounds may become politically unacceptable and thus be deleted from the arsenal. If DU penetrators prove their worth during our recent combat activities, then we should assure their future existence, parentheses, until something better is developed, through service DOD proponency. If proponency is not garnered, it is possible that we stand to lose a valuable combat capability. I believe we should keep this sensitive issue in mind whenever after action reports are written. Respectfully, Colonel Michael Zeme. I was told to lie. What you learned, what you saw, write it so that they could always use depleted uranium munitions. The health effects of depleted uranium munitions. I got another memorandum on 8 March of 1991. And this came from uh, the Defense Nuclear Agency. And I'll just read one small quote in here. As explosive ordnance disposals Ground combat units and civil population of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq come increasingly into contact with DU ordnance. We must be prepared to deal with the potential problems. Toxic war souvenirs, political furor, and post-conflict cleanup, post-nation agreements, are only some of the issues that must be addressed. Alpha particles, uranium oxide dust from expended rounds is a health concern, but beta particles, and fragments from intact rounds is a serious health threat with a possible exposure rate of 200 millirads per hour on contact. Now we actually measured it and it's not 200, it's 300 millirads, millirads per hour on contact. However, the total permissible U.S. dose is 100 milli per year. So in 20 minutes you exceed the U.S. dose for the general public and we spread 350 tons throughout Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. We deliberately did it in Kosovo and the Balkans in 94 and 95, again in 1999. We shot up Vieques, Puerto Rico, deliberately in 1999, Okinawa, Korea, and numerous states, and don't do anything about it. So we're told that they have known what the health effects are, so I get a memo sent to me as the health physicist saying, Hey, lie when you find, when you, what, on what you find. We won't always be able to use it, but here's the serious health effects. And then a couple of years ago, I finally discovered out why. In 1943, in 1943, the United States was at war, World War II. General Leslie Groves was the head of the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb. And at that time, some of the greatest physicists in the history of the world, Conant, Compton, and Urey, sent a letter to General Groves, and they recommended that the United States deliberately use radioactive materials in uranium to contaminate air, water, and soil to cause the respiratory, the blood, the cancers, the gastrointestinal, all the effects that we encountered on myself within my team and all the friendly fire within 72 hours in the Iraqis, okay? in all over the place. So it was known all the way back. No wonder the, the Defense Nuclear Agency March 8th memo said it's a serious health threat. It's not a question. It was there and known all along. How does it work? It kills everything on impact. It's a firestorm. It's unbelievable. 
Now, when it gets into the body, what we found out is it causes the, the respiratory problems fairly rapidly because that's what happened to me and my guys and everybody else. It's like super asthma, okay? And then what develops then is calcified granulomas and you develop what's called reactive airway disease. You basically drowned when you try to do any activity. Already known, always known happening. The rashes come in. Now, what happens is the uranium... You got a bio half-life. When it gets into the body through respiration, 57% is insoluble. So now I got this heavy, heavy metal particle that's also radiological sitting in the lungs, and it's going to cause the particulate damage, just like breathing coal or dirt or you know wheat chaff or anything in. It's not a good day. But now they got the radiological component that's irradiated in the lungs at 300 millirems per hour just for beta. In the alpha particles, I've measured up around. 1,200 to 15,000 just depends on what they are, but it's irradiating, so it's causing all kinds of damage. Permanent damage in the lungs. The 1943 memorandum said it would start within hours and days and permanent damage within weeks, and it happened. It happened to me and happened to everybody else. Now, the other 43% is soluble fraction. That soluble fraction of uranium, now this is a heavy metal radiological toxin that goes to the lymph glands and messes up your immune system. It goes to your teeth and re displaces the calcium in your teeth. And so what we're seeing today and what's happened to me recently is I'll be eating a piece of bread or something and my teeth just fracture off and I'm getting the same report from all over the country. There's no calcium in the tooth so the tooth structure just breaks. We also have the uranium going into the bone. It's a calcium seeker so it replaces the uranium in the bone so now you've got osteopenia and osteoporitis starting out right away, not even a question. Then you have the uranium going down to the kidney, and it's like a seed. It's a kidney stone, forms a kidney stone. Now that uranium is extremely soft. Uranium is not hard, it's extremely soft. Then you get the calcium and the oxalates, the other things that come down, now you get a kidney stone forming. However, you've got the radioactive component that's causing tissue damage, and the heavy metal that's causing tissue damage, and you form scar tissue called a thyrocast around the uranium, and you can't get it out of the, out of the kidney. Ecto, you know, shockwave lithotripsy, the current value, way that you break up a kidney stone without doing surgery, won't work. It's a soft complex. It won't break it up. So that kidney stone is embedded in the kidney, and they keep forming. And I, I don't know how many, I gave up my number of kidney surgeries. After a while, they just said, you know, it's in the dozens. There's no cent in count in, counting them anymore. That stone forms in there and they can't remove it unless they remove it from surgery. Now the uranium stone is formed down there and it's locked in the lower part of the kidney in the calyx. So what you have is continued chronic kidney pain. How would you like to go to war, have them use ammunition, not provide medical care, not tell you, and then when you get so painful that you literally can't step into your own pants? It's not a good day. So we've got all these things happening. And then the cancer is developed. Member of my team, he had the first bunk in our tent closest to the uranium contamination in the Gulf War, and he developed uh, cancer of the pharynx and the larynx, you know, up here in the back of the throat within eight months. He's dead. Sitting's dead. They're, I mean, I just, Sewell's dead. I just count and count and count. Dave Kiefer, the guy that had the responsibility, and his dad's already there, dead from lymphoma because his dad was a civilian that came over to help us clean up the mess. And this is where it comes in very important to what's just recently happened in Idaho. Mr. Kiefer had the responsibility for cleaning up the DU armor and fixing the DU armor on the messed up tanks. And he's already died of cancer. They said the civilians weren't there and did it. Well, it's real funny. I got a picture of them doing it. Yeah, I guess it was my imagination. And it continues on that work. Was the Gulf War an easy war? <laughs> Not hardly. It was a toxic wasteland. And it's still a toxic wasteland today. It's not changed. A toxic wasteland. From chemical and biological materials that Iraq deliberately used on us that we sold him, and he manufactured more from, that we then deliberately went and blew up in place that whipped it back on us starting in early when we got into the war, that we blow up immediately after the war. Camasilla is probably the most famous one, but there were well over 105 sites that we knew of and blew up. 
Now the Camasilla, the Saren, the Cyclo Saren that was blew up from Camasilla, personally got me at 200 miles away. The Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Defense Dr. Bernard Rosker, sent a letter to me, he was Deputy Secretary, said, Doug, you were hit by Saren and Cyclo Saren, go to the VA and get care. Well, I was 200 miles away. That's how far it goes. 105 sites all over. Then Scott Ritter's team, UNSCOM, God bless Scott Ritter, they went in and they blew up a whole bunch more and destroyed a whole bunch more of this stuff. Now guess where that came back on? The U.S. troops, the environment, the Iraqis, the Kuwaitis, the Saudis. And we wonder why the health effects and the photographs that are out there in the lobby and the next at the church are there and the kids are sick and dying. It's not even a question. So where does the blame land? It lands all over the place. But when we decide deliberately use depleted uranium munitions, refuse to provide medical care, refuse to clean up the environment, we got a problem that we must deal with. What, hap what happened when we looked at all this stuff? Had all the orders. The orders kept coming on down. We started do the medical care, provide the environmental cleanup. The orders never ceased. And the exposures never ceased because the medical care was never provided and the environmental cleanup was never done. One of the most disturbing facts that's happening right now, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm glad to see veterans in our audience today because, you know, again, they help protect our freedom and that's what it's all about. But at the same time, when we go to war, if we use a weapon, we have to look at the responsibility and the consequences of the use of that weapon. The Gulf War had a total casualty count of 760 casualties when we redeployed in 1991. Redeployed means that we bring the troops back home. You know, for me, I came back home and I went back to my laboratory at the University of Illinois in the physics department. Other ones back at plumbers and farmers and firemen and policemen. Today, ladies and gentlemen, a firm casually count from Gulf War I, which was the one-year period, basically August of 1990, through the fall of 1991. These are the individuals who were actually involved in combat or the cleanup. The casually count, those that have received Department of Veteran Affairs disabilities, that means service connection for injuries and illnesses caused during combat, has gone from about 463 injured and ill to 159,238. Now this doesn't include mine because mine came after this number was released officially. And over 8,000 dead. I went from 294 dead to over 8,000 dead. I went from 463 injured and ill as a direct result of combat to over 159,000. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Gulf War is the largest friendly fire incident in the history of warfare. And depleted uranium is one of the primary culprits. That's hard to say because I'm an army officer that was tasked to clean up the mess. Now, we didn't stop deploying troops over there, ladies and gentlemen, and troops are still going over there, and they're about ready to go over there again into a toxic wasteland. Since 1991, we continued to send troops over to the Gulf region, to Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. The number of casualties now from the extended Persian Gulf War, ladies and gentlemen, the individuals that have been awarded disability from the United States Department of Veteran Affairs for service-connected injuries in the Persian Gulf is a quarter of a million. One-third of the force that went to the Gulf War is now under disability because of the health effects of this toxic wasteland and depleted uranium munitions. We knew the criteria for what happens that you need medical care. If you're in and around a vehicle that's struck, if you're in and around working any of the uranium munitions that's burned, any of the residue, the smoke, if you're working around the stuff as our friends over in Idaho did, working with the armor and everything, you need medical care. That directive was issued on June 8th of 1993. It was reissued in August of 1993 by General Erickson Secchi, 
Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry, General Shinseki is the general that's sending the pride and youth of your community to war again within weeks. And he directed that medical care be provided, training and education be done, and environmental cleanup be done. And it's not been completed. In October of 1993, when we were going to use uranium munitions in Somalia, Somalia, ladies and gentlemen, in Africa, we got it stopped. But they specified exactly what criteria for exposures were supposed to receive medical care, and it never has happened. By my count, as the investigating officer during the Gulf War, I had a little over 120, 123 individuals that lived in friendly fire through depleted uranium munitions impacts. I had another 250 total involved in all of the cleanup and everything else after the war, known exposures. The United States Department of Veteran Affairs in Baltimore, Maryland, just up until recently, it only provided care for 33 individuals, not even one-fourth of the friendly fire that survived. In the last count I had, it was up to 60 of us. Now, they've had me up there one time, but the doctor in charge up there never returns any of my phone calls at all since 1999. Doesn't return phone calls to my physician at all, even though myself and my guys are sick. A little over a week ago, I called Dave up down in Alabama, and I said, Hey, Dave, you getting your medical care yet? What's happened? He said, No, they haven't given it to me yet. The number two man on the whole thing has still not received medical care, and he's very sick. The orders have been repeated over and over and over again, and it's never been complied with, and they don't have any intention of complying with it. Because, ladies and gentlemen, as the Los Alamos Memorandum directed, when you find the findings, you lie so that we can always use this in warfare because it's an extremely effective weapon. Not a question of the health effects, not a question of what needs to be done, but it just goes on. In 1992, the United States Senate ordered the United States Army Environmental Policy Institute to, quote, Conduct a study on the health and environmental consequences of depleted uranium on the battlefield, remediation technologies which might be developed, and the ways in which toxicity of depleted uranium might be reduced. Please note that depleted uranium is fully supported by the Army as an item that gives the American soldier the winning edge on the modern battlefield. Thus, it is important to realize that the use of depleted uranium was carefully compared against other materials and determined to be superior. And it is. I did the assessment on the damage on Iraqi and U.S., and it's fantastic. When you go to war, the purpose is to kill. Use the best weapon you can. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I must ask, I must urge, that when we go to war, if we go to war, and I hope we never go to war again, that we have to make sure that the warriors, the soldiers, and everybody know that you have to deal with the consequence of the weapons you use. You can't take radioactive materials and deliberately and willfully throw them in somebody else's backyard, deliberately and willfully deny medical care to the U.S. veterans, the heroes of our nation. You can't deliberately and willfully deny medical care or the protocols to the enemy soldiers because according to the Geneva Conventions, if I shoot the enemy and he survives, I've got to provide him medical care. We have forgotten something about ethics and morality. And it never ceases to amaze me. Now the medical care directives that were coming out just didn't end with that. In 1993, when we're trying to get all the medical care put together, the U.S. Army Medical Department sent an order out, and in that order they deliberately said to leave the uranium shrapnel embedded in the arms and the bodies of the U.S. friendly fire casualties to determine what the health effects would be. And Jerry Wheat developed cancer, and the individual that wrote the memorandum when we were in Washington, D.C., testified, sat right next to him, and said, oh, sorry, Jerry, no, it didn't really cause it. It's a crime against God and humanity, and it never stops. And it never stops. The medical directives have been issued the cleanup procedures I developed. We told, how do you clean it up or what you can do? But as we started to do this, we found out that for every single vehicle that's destroyed, I have to pick up that vehicle physically, 
Now, it's got all kinds of unexploded ordnance in there and everything else, so it's a bomb in of itself. Okay, so you can move it, jink it, whatever you want to bump it or anything, and it'll blow up. Three of my guys died at a place called Doha when that whole thing blew up in August of 1991 because they were trying to clean up a destroyed tank, and that ammo was unstable, blew them to smithereens. Two of my other team members, one was gone trying to get a truck, and the other one, the only reason he survived is because he was able to duck down underneath the desk. Unbelievable mess. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, the United States Army command staff at the Pentagon and Schwarzkopf and Zulus told me to clean up the depleted uranium mess. They really called me to active duty as the depleted uranium project de director, develop all the training and education necessary to make our troops safe and NATO troops safe when they use it. They ordered me to develop the environmental cleanup procedures. And we found out that for each single vehicle, I'd have to take that vehicle, physically remove it, and then scrape all the dirt down to six inches out to 400 meter radius in order to make it safe. The highway of death, ladies and gentlemen, is a toxic wasteland depleted uranium mess as we speak. The Seattle Post Intelligencer, Larry Johnson, just wrote an article, and we worked on talk with him. They went over there and measured the contamination physically at the site, and it was a thousand times permissible. Had nothing to do with the U.S. Army measurement. That's your own local newspaper and your congressman. Not a question. An unbelievable mess. Ladies and gentlemen, when you go to war, the purpose is to kill. However, when we go to war, we have to remember what are the health and environmental consequences of the weapons that we choose to use in war. The Army asked me to clean this up. I myself am affected. The individuals that I asked to work with me are sick and dead. The pride and youth of our nation are sick and dying, and they've been denied medical care. And the casualty rate now for all individuals deployed to the Persian Gulf is over a quarter of a million. And we're about to go to war again. The gas mask, ladies and gentlemen, that we wear when we go to war, that was supposed to protect us there during the war, doesn't work. The United States General Accounting Office has absolutely verified that, and the Army knows it. When you move your head, the seal breaks under your chin, and when you don't have a seal, when you go into it, whether it's chemical or biological or radiological, you're going to breathe it in. And you're going to get sick and you're going to die. A little over a year ago, last summer, in June, I was invited to the United Nations UNESCO Child and the Family Conference in Athens, Greece, to discuss the effects of war on children. The United States and England were the only two nations that refused to participate in the conference. Arrogance, ladies and gentlemen. The conference was about the effect of war on the child. We're in the most appropriate place today. 2,000 years ago, it was said, and a child shall lead them. And my hope and dream for all of you in the world is that peace will come. And maybe the prophecy will be refilled again, and a child shall lead them. But if the children are dead due to the consequences of war, the refusals to deal with the health and environmental consequences of the use of disastrous weapons, where will the child come from? Where will be that child that will lead us to peace? Thank you. Are there any uh, uranium-238 uh, uh, substitutes that should be used instead of um, this substance? The primary substitute, which I would recommend, and again has the effectiveness of a penetrator, is a tungsten penetrator. Uh, again, the Department of Defense even acknowledges in the videos that we've done that tungsten the difference is basically you can fire a tungsten round at 2,000 meters versus a DU round at 3,000 meters have the same effect. However, the type of battles we're going to have are very seldom going to be in the desert again. So when you're in close range comparison, 
Tungsten's a lot better. It doesn't leave all the environmental and health effects that DU does. Uh, I don't have any idea on cost. Uh, John Stanford was the former superintendent of Seattle schools and former general in charge of supply during the Gulf War. He died a few years ago of cancer. Do you think he could have been a victim of depleted uranium? I'm under, I don't know the individual. However, you know, with all the host of exposures we had during the Gulf War, uh, you'd have to go back and do assessment and find out what his health effects were, where, we, where he was in the Gulf War. But he came back sick and died from the Gulf War, more than likely, yeah, that's what happened. Was it DU? I don't know. Depends on whether or not he had the exposures downwind, in a vehicle, in equipment, cleaning it up. But there's so many exposures we can't separate out. That's one of the problems with the medical evidence. We're not in a laboratory. We're not in a hospital. We're dealing with reality. And the reality is, if you see something wrong and you find it, you know they got the exposures, you can make an estimate, but you can't prove it. The Department of Defense wants everybody to prove whether or not they were exposed and that their health effects come from that. Unfortunately, in a war, you can't do it. Can you describe how depleted uranium gets into groundwater and the food chain and its effects there? Depleted uranium is going to get into the groundwater and the food chain multiple ways. You've got all the uranium dust contamination, all the equipment that breaks down, that then moves into the water table and in the water supplies. In the food, you have uranium oxides and everything that actually be absorbed into the plant structure. Now, one thing that we do know, the United States Army's common task training specifically states that uranium contamination will make food and water unusable. So when you have that, ladies and gentlemen, and it also states in there they must wear full respiratory and skin protection, we also know it happens forever. Therefore, when the Army personally says that food and water will be contaminated, and that's an indiscriminate killer, that makes the use of depleted uranium a crime against God and a crime against humanity. Because it doesn't matter, and again, and the child shall lead us. Has Gulf War syndrome finally been recognized as a toxic illness? No. Gulf War syndrome has been not recognized as a toxic illness, and the reason is if they have to acknowledge what happened to all of the veterans during the Gulf War and since the Gulf War, then they have to acknowledge that the same thing happened to the civilians. And the civilians, the women and the children, and everybody else don't deserve this. The non-combatants don't deserve it. So no, they don't want to recognize it. And all of us that speak out suffer massive retaliation for speaking out, for finishing our job. Again, when will responsibility happen? We've got to make it happen. What studies have been conducted about the effects of depleted uranium on Iraqi soldiers and or civilians? The World Health Organization has been asked numerous times to do the study. The British Royal Society has been asked numerous times to do the study. In 1999, the end of February, beginning of March, when I was appointed the Center for Disease Control, uh, Denise Nichols and myself and others made the proposal that the, and Dr. Bill Bombswagger made the proposal that they do do the study. They've never done it. Uh, on April 16th of 1999, we went up and met with the Presidential Oversight Board that was under uh, General Elmo Zumwalt and uh, Senator Rudman, and we specifically made that proposal. And Rosalie Bertel, we all did it, and they've never done it. Now, Dr. Asif Durakovich and Dr. Harry Sharma have gone over. They have collected the biological samples, radiobioassays, and they have verified that the individuals over there are hot for depleted uranium. In meetings with the Department of Defense, when we presented Dr. Sharma's and Dr. Durakovich's results, the Department of Defense representative in charge of depleted uranium said, we'll have to get him fired, and they did. In your opinion, uh, how many people uh, living in areas 
where depleted uranium are used are affected at this time? Just a second, please. The individuals affected uh, by depleted uranium, if you're in an area, again, coming back to the criteria for exposures, okay, and uh, I've got to pull that paper up again if you wait a moment. If, you, if you're in the area, that's basically, if you're in the area where you're downwind of any contamination, where you work in the area of any contamination, if you've gone within 400 meters of any contamination, if you've been down within a fire or you go back in an area that was contaminated, then you need medical care. That's the Department of Defense's own specific guidelines. Okay? So it's not a question. It goes back to the October 1993 directive. But the other thing, the June 1993 directive said anybody affected by it. So the men, the women, and children all over the world, Vieques, Puerto Rico, any place where it's been used and they come into those criteria, they need medical care. And if they're sick, more than likely they had an exposure. But again, when you don't do the medical testing, you don't find it. If you don't find it, you're not responsible. If you're not responsible, you don't have to do anything. That's why medical care was denied to myself and all of the rest of the individuals, and it still is. What is the status of the bill introduced by Reverend, uh, Representative McKinney to ban DU use and sale and development? Representative McKinney, and again at our urging, and I met with her and her staff, and we tried to get uh, that bill in. The bill is locked in committee waiting for Department of Defense uh, some type of comments or anything. I don't know. We need to force it all out. But remember, it's not going to be locked out. As, lost lo as long as the Los Alamos Directive and the API Directive are considered the way it goes, they're going to use DU forever. And anything that gets in the way, they're going to stop cold. What are the proper cleanup measures for uranium-238? Can these sites be adequately, adequately cleaned? The cleanup procedures is you have to physically pick up the, uh, the contaminated equipment, vehicle, or structure. But prior to do that, especially in a war, you have to unload all the unexploded munitions that are now extremely unstable. You have to remove all the hazardous materials that are out of there then what you have to do is either take that a facility like Barnwell, South Carolina, that's a four multi-million dollar facility, it took them four years to clean up 24 vehicles. Now, four years for 24 vehicles in a specialized facility? What about the thousands upon thousands of vehicles littering all the battle areas? Then once you get that vehicle removed, you have to take the soil down to four inches for 400 meter radius and dispose of that properly. You can't do it. I wish you could. I tried to develop, but you can't, sir. Yes, in certain areas they are. Yes, they are. Are they now? No, sir, they're not. I wouldn't eat anything out of Chesapeake Bay for anything under my life because of all the contamination from both the chemical, biological, and especially the uranium coming from Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. And we wonder why Chesapeake Bay has gone from one of the greatest fishing grounds in the world to nothing. It's all contaminated. Just a second. I can't hear you. Okay, again, this is a total confusion, and the individual who started the confusion did it deliberately. I'm holding a pen up here. If you have depleted uranium round, okay, this round is solid uranium. It's not the tip of the pen up here, it's not the back, and it's not coated. Each round is solid uranium-238. 
Again, this is a thing to get everybody confused as if it's not a whole lot there. Okay? Now, in Puerto Rico, we know that they used it in February of 1999. I tried to activate my team, the one that we developed for the military, to go clean it up and get medical care. We refused that. We could not do it by the Secretary of Defense. Now, we know from conversations and emails that I've had with U.S. Navy personnel down there that they've been shooting up for a long time because the Navy personnel on the ships and in the areas where they're using it on the guns uh, are getting sick from uranium and they were having the same health effects. We coordinated those with Dr. McDermott for medical care. But again, that never gets out. The Department of Energy is using uh, uranium for these bombs. What else are they using it for? Or are they being recycled into consumer products and marketed? They have over 700,000 metric tons stored at Paducah, Kentucky, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and Portsmouth, Ohio. So what, if you go to the United States Department of Energy website and pull up the environmental impact statement for uranium hexafluoride, you will find out that they want to sell it in concrete. That's called du -crete. They want to put it in road building materials. They want to put it in buildings and structures, and they want to use it in weapons. So yes, be careful what you buy. Now, the other thing that we do know and have verified 100% is as a consequence of war, they decided to recycle the metals from combat. So the United States Navy has bought cooking pots to serve fixed food and serve food to our Navy sailors on their ships that are contaminated with uranium metal as a consequence of war and recycled. Be careful where you buy your car bumper. We had a case in Mattoon, Illinois, where the they found the bumper was radioactive and it had been processed uh, into a new bumper and it was uranium contaminated metal from the Gulf War, went through Japan and got down to a bumper that was sold in Mattoon, Illinois. 